but it's all around us. We're using it the whole time. And I wonder, Catherine, if you could start us with that. What does AI look like in the world right now? So I think it's a very good point that AI is a really ill-defined term, and I don't think it has you know, a real concrete definition of what it is. And so the best I can come up with is computers trying to sort of emulate some sort of human intelligence. And obviously, we're a very long way from, and hopefully we'll get to that question of how close are we to human intelligence. But we're on the path to computers that are becoming more and more intelligent. And I think if we look at some of the ways that technology is used right now in the world, we can see some real good examples of artificial intelligence and how it's used. You mentioned Alexa. Obviously, that is, a, I, think, I think, a very nice example of how AI is working at the moment. And if you have Alexa or you've talked to Siri or any of these other virtual assistants, you might have a sense of how good the technology is. You know, it can listen to you. It can understand certain things. It does a lot of smart stuff behind the scenes. But also, it has some limitations. I'm not going to say that it, it's solved um, conversation. And so you get a sense of these sort of limitations and potential if you look at things that are out there in the real world. And this technology is being used in all sorts of other places as well that you may or may not know about. There's a very interesting project I'm working on with a company which is about dubbing um, videos from one language into another using synthetic speech, using AI to do that, that dubbing. And these are places where the technology is now really getting good enough, despite having some limitations, it's getting good enough to be used in these sort of real-world scenarios. So I think, yeah, taking a look at where AI is used right now is a great introduction to how it works. We, we've got to be careful. I've just been told we can't say Alexa because people watching back home uh, <laughs> is all going haywire. So that was the last time. I know saying, hey, we know what her name is. And we'll talk about the gender nature of that as well, actually. Um, Chris, that's a great summary of where we are now, um, but it is in all sorts of fields. What do you, you see a lot of it, especially on the really cutting edge side. What are you most excited by in terms of the applications of AI? Well, I think we've seen huge advances even just in the last couple of years or so, and it's sort of become ubiquitous. So there are many, many places that AI shows up in our daily lives that we don't know about. I mean, I think, you know, Arthur Clarke, the science fiction writer once said, you know, the, the best technology is ones that disappear into the, into the background. They help you in your daily lives. You're not aware of it. So it's just all sorts of things like, you know, uh, opening your phone with your face or um, uh, translating from one language to another on a website or just many, many, many examples of this. Um, but I do have a real sense that the... And I've been in the field for about 35 years. I mean, we've, we, the field has been called machine learning that I've been in and rather than artificial intelligence. But it's really a... Machine learning has really a, become the dominant approach to artificial intelligence. And really, just in the last year or two, we've seen just extraordinary advances to the point where um, I think the next few years in particular will see some very rapid changes. I think coming back to Catherine's you know, excellent description of artificial intelligence, it's, it's a slippery fish, it's very hard to define. I think there are many different axes to intelligence, different kinds of intelligence. Uh, and, and, and some of these, in terms of artificial intelligence, are progressing very rapidly, uh, and others are making slower progress. Others have almost been solved, in effect. Um, so, really, the way research progresses, it doesn't progress uniformly on all fronts. There are certain areas that are very exciting. Um, the field that I'm particularly excited about is the impact of machine learning and artificial intelligence on the natural sciences, on chemistry, physics, biology. Uh, this is a very exciting field. It's such an exciting field that I've actually pivoted my career, uh, started a new role, building up a, a global team in this space, because we think that machine learning will have a big impact on our ability to, to model and simulate the world with, with uh, many applications in, in drug discovery and understanding human disease, in discovering new materials, particularly for sustainability, new battery materials, new photovoltaics, uh, catalysts, ways of capturing carbon directly from the air, and so on. So that's the field that I'm particularly excited about right now. And Anna, what are you looking at and thinking, wow, that's interesting, that's changing my understanding? There has been enormous progress in machine learning and AI. I've also been involved on the edges of the field for 20 years as a neuroscientist with a deep interest in, in machine learning and, and AI. Um, but what's, what's striking, it's a little bit like what you said, Catherine, that it's, there's lots of very specific applications out there. And then if you look at what AI systems, in my understanding, are still not very good at, they are the kinds of things that we do associate with specifically human kinds of intelligence, things like generalizing to new situations very quickly, learning things from very small amounts of data. We don't need to be trained on an internet's worth of cat pictures to recognize a cat as a human being. Um, there's knowing why we know what we know. You know we, we know something we can say, I have, that, I have confidence in this judgment. We have insight into our, into our knowledge. 
And then there's the, the sort of guiding of behavior. Yeah, sure, we have self-driving cars and drones that, that fly around. But as much progress as there has been in things like playing Go or solving equations in natural sciences, we still don't have the kind of AI that can control bodies in the way that you know, we often used to see in, in science fiction. And it may be that we don't need these things. Maybe this is not the goal. Maybe this is not the future of AI. But that raises the, the interesting question of how much AI can tell us about the human brain. That, for me, that's, that's the frontier that I'm interested in. You know, what can these new generations of machine learning and artificial intelligence models reveal about cognition, thoughts, in humans, in other animals, and ultimately, of course, this big question of why, for, for us, there is consciousness, why it feels like anything to be this complex biological machine that we are. And I think AI is very, very far from shedding much useful light on that question. We, we still need to solve that question by the end of the <laughs> panel, though, so <laughs> hop to it. I mean, that's really, it, it feels like, you know, artificial intelligence, I think it conditions us maybe to think of a mirror version of human intelligence, but actually we've got a new type of intelligence. This is, you know, the A words and the S word. It does something that humans don't need to do, uh, and they do it in very different ways. Um, Chris, you mentioned that the last two years have been the sort of Cambrian uh, explosion of uh, new ideas and really, really coming along. And Catherine as well, what, what's been driving that? We've had peaks and troughs with AI research, the AI winters where funding dries up and it's very unfashionable to even talk about AI, and then these boom towns, boom times, sorry. It seems like we're in a boom time. What's been driving that? I think there are a couple of things, actually, a couple of discoveries that we've made in the field in the last two years that are quite transformational. Um, the first one has to do with scale. So I, I switched from physics into machine learning into AI about 35 years ago because I was excited about the idea of machines that could learn. Um, it was probably a little naive back then because we thought that, uh, 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 we call them neural networks, these models that we build in the computer. Uh, they have, um, back then, hundreds or thousands of these adjustable parameters. They're, they're rather, superficially, rather like the synapses in, in between neurons in the brain. And they adjust as the system learns. And we thought a neural network with a thousand of these adjustable parameters was a big network. But what we discovered in, in the last couple of years or so is that as you go to very large systems, new properties emerge, new capabilities emerge. So um, we have colleagues at, in, uh, at uh, a company called OpenAI who a couple of years ago plotted a graph and, it, and on the horizontal axis was, uh, was time from the 1960s up to about 2020. And on the vertical axis was how much compute do you need to train the state of the art in machine learning? Um, and, it, it follows, and it was on a, a, what we call a logarithmic scale. So basically, when you see a straight line, uh, what it means is the amount of compute was doubling every two years or so. And what that meant was the field was benefiting, like everything else, it was benefiting from Moore's law, the, the, the doubling in compute power every couple of years. But then since about 2012, something remarkable has happened. Again, it's a straight line, but it's much steeper. What it means is that the amount of compute needed to train the biggest models uh, has been doubling, not every two years, but about every three and a half months. So it means it's about a factor of 10 per year, and that has continued to hold. And with every factor of 10, we're seeing new, new capabilities emerge that didn't exist at the previous factor of 10. So that's been one sort of breakthrough. Now, um, you know, uh, Anna was talking about you know, all the data that you need to train these systems. So of course, as you go up in factor of 10, you need 10 times as much compute, 10 times as much data. But the other discovery that we've made is, is what's called transfer learning. The idea that a system can learn um, to solve one problem, it then becomes much faster at learning a new one. So I'll give you a simple example. If you, um, you, you find a sort of a blob on your skin and you're, you're wondering, you know, is that just an annoying little thing or is that, is that some sort of cancer that's going to spread and kill me? And of course, you'd go to a dermatologist and they would, they would look at this and, and, uh, and, and diagnose it. And so people were wondering, could you, um, could you just take a photograph of this? And from the photograph, could a machine tell the difference? Now, the problem there is there aren't there may be hundreds of thousands of examples of this, but from a machine learning point of view, there really isn't very much data. And so a team of researchers tackled this by taking another machine learning system that had been trained on a very large data set of things like you know, bicycles and cats and dogs and mushrooms and so on. Uh, it, it, and, and they took that big trained system and then just retrained the last little layer on this new task using a much smaller amount of data. And, and it achieves... Uh, human-level performance on that particular task, comparable to uh, a team of professional dermatologists. So this is a very interesting result. So what it means is that as these systems go to very large scale, 
they can become much broader because throughout much of the history of, of AI, we, we've developed a system over here for speech recognition, another system over here for natural language understanding or something, and they've been rather separate. And so what we're seeing now is a convergence of different technologies into a single, into a single model. So it's made this a very, very interesting time to be in the field. Yeah, that, that's really exciting. Um, just a reminder, um, before I get to you, Catherine, um, please submit your questions by scanning the QR code, but also vital that you add your name to it, otherwise we can't find you to ask the question. <laughs> and it will get asked, but you won't get the glory of having your name associated with it. And if you're on Twitter, the hashtag is hashtag big ideas live 22. I mean, that does sound incredibly exciting, the way you've done it, uh, you've, the way you've told it there. Um, but there's sort of talk of very, very large um, systems and new properties emerging, at the same time being used in very vital ways, as you say, cancer identification. But we know algorithms are used in all sorts of important decisions in our lives. And, you know, in the States, in some places, they're used in sentencing criminals, things like that. How worried, ignoring the Terminator question, which we'll do, but how worried should we be now about regulating this? Sometimes it seems like a black box. How do we open that up and make sure it's being fair, um, we're not making the wrong decisions. Yep. So I think it, you're right, it is a bit of a black box at the moment to be able to see inside some of these AI machine learning systems and understand how they're arriving at the decision that they're making. And that is a really difficult problem to solve. And I don't think that we have the tools and techniques to be able to look inside that now. So we can't, for example, ask a neural network to justify a decision about, say, sentencing in the same way that you could ask a human judge to justify that decision. And so that's one area that I think we really need to spend some effort into developing tools and techniques to look inside that black box and figure out. But one of the things that we can do and we should be doing is looking at how these systems work in the real world. So judging whether they are exhibiting bias against particular groups by judging how they're working on, on real people's data. Um, there are many examples of how face recognition systems and speech recognition systems end up performing worse on particular demographics, particular groups of people, just because of the way that they've been trained or the, the sort of data that they've already seen is not representative of the real world. And so we really need to be spending time and effort, say, taking a speech recognition system and making sure that it works across a range of accents with the similar kind of accuracy or looking at face recognition systems and being sure that they are actually performing well for different people because when these systems are used in the world and they become part of everybody's day-to-day -day life, obviously it um, holds people back if these systems are treating them differently to, to other groups of people. So that's a real area that I think is receiving quite a lot of attention right now. People are trying to understand how neural networks are, are working and we're making progress in how to evaluate them for, for actual real world problems. When we talk about um, emergent properties as well, um, some people would argue that consciousness is an emergent property of a brain. Are we ever going to realize, Anna, when a machine might become sentient? Do you, a, do you think that's even possible? And B, how would we know? The answer to the first question, is it even possible? I think the honest answer is that nobody really knows. Okay. The reason nobody really knows for a machine is that nobody really knows even for other animals, other human beings even. I cannot be 100% sure that you are conscious, though I think you are. I'm trying. And it's, it's, it's a unique problem in science. To try, in some sense, we know, and we've known for, for hundreds of thousands of years, that consciousness depends on the brain and the body in a fundamental way. You change the brain, you change your conscious experience. Yet, unlike other problems in biology, and indeed all of science, consciousness is a private, subjective experience. I can't put a conscious experience on the table and we can all look at it and agree. I can tell you about my experience, but it's, it's essentially indirect. And that's what that's, some people have said this means we can't even address the problem with the tools of science and philosophy. I think that's entirely wrong. We can, it's just that there are going to be some limits on the data that we can get. Now, we are learning an increasing amount about what the basis of consciousness is in the human brain, which parts of the brain are necessary or not necessary. Um, but we still don't know the answer to a fundamental question, which is, does consciousness depend on the stuff that something is made of? You, know, you and I are made out of carbon. We have biological neurons. We have wetware rather than the hardware. Does that matter? 
Now, there's one school of thought that says it doesn't. If you program a computer the right way, if the next generation of machine learning architectures is, is trained in enough data, and the next thing that might emerge might be awareness. But there's no real good reason to assume that's the case. Some things, if you, it doesn't matter what it's made of. A computer that plays chess really plays chess. But other things, the material matters, like a computer simulation of a weather forecast that we all use too. It doesn't actually get wet and windy inside the computer that simulates the weather. And consciousness, you know, consciousness is not the same thing as intelligence. And I think this is a crucial distinction to make because it's so often said, like, not by anyone here, of course, but in the wider public, that, that consciousness is some function of intelligence. That once AI crosses some threshold, then the lights come on, and it's not only going to be smart, it's going to be sentient. Mm. But I think this is, comes from a place of, of human exceptionalism. We think we're really special as humans. We, we think we're intelligent, and we know we're conscious, so we think the things go together. But consciousness, we should define it, actually. I mean, consciousness is really any kind of experience whatsoever. It feels like something to be a conscious system. But you can, an experience of pain or of seeing color is, is enough. You, know, you don't have to have complex cognition going on uh, in order to be, be conscious. So there's no real good reason to expect that simply ratcheting up intelligence is going to make uh, an AI system conscious. And just by observing apparently intelligent behavior, I don't think it's a reliable signature of whether the thing is conscious. And I think we can be misled here. Systems can give us a strong intuition that there's a conscious mind there when there's just the whirring of algorithms. We'll, we'll come back to that. It's a really interesting point, uh, which ties into a later talk. Uh, Chris, we should check first whether you, do you have any sentient robots up in Cambridge locked away in the lab and you just haven't told people about it? Well, actually, I loved Anil's answer, right? This panel is discussing two different things, I think. Mm. One is the, the ability to create machines that have certain information processing and reasoning capabilities, which is a, a fantastically exciting field with uh, enormous practical implications, actually addressing some of society's most uh, challenging problems right now, uh, and with potential for um, the wrong things to happen. I think Catherine gave a lovely description there of how we need the right guardrails in, in how we create and deploy this technology. And on the other hand, this fascinating question of consciousness, which is a personal subjective experience. I, I experience consciousness. I'm guessing you experience something similar because, you know, we're all broadly the same, within the same species and so on. And, and this tremendously difficult question of ever knowing what a, a machine experiences or whether it experiences anything. And I think that's one of the, one of the toughest problems in science in a way, it's just it's very hard to know even where to get started. I think just separating out those two, I think is actually very helpful for the discussion and not conflating them. Why do you think we have this obsession with wanting to have <laughs> conscious machines? As Sarah James is saying, it's such a trope of science fiction. You know, some brilliant films about it, some bad films about it as well. It's something we clearly feel the need to see in the world. Why is that, Catherine? I think you're right. It is a trope of science fiction and we we want to emulate ourselves somehow in what we do, and so people are driven to build replicas of, of people, build technology which is like us. But if you look back over time, you see that it's been a constant thread through the history of technology, that people have wanted to assign human agency to technology, even to other inanimate objects. You'll hear people talking about how their, you know, their TV is annoyed with them or something like that. <laughs> we assign human, human properties to technology and to other things. There's um, a famous example of a chatbot which was built back in the 60s called Eliza, which was a very simple chatbot. It was a therapist. Um, it had some canned answers, so you, you tell it your problem and it might say, can you tell me more about that? Or sometimes it would flip your, your question back on you, so you might say, I'm feeling unhappy, and it would say, can you tell me why you're feeling unhappy? Very simple responses. Um, and the, the creator of this program wanted to show how stupid computers were. But, but people did believe that Eliza had human-like intelligence. And, and the creator was very surprised by this, that he could that had the opposite him. effect. He had the opposite basically. effect. And, and I think that this trend has sort of carried on through. People are really keen to assign human properties to computers, especially when they're using language and other human-like animations and, and that sort of thing. And did you want to... Yeah, yeah, just to come in briefly on this, I think you're absolutely right that we do project agency and intention mm. and also consciousness yep. on, onto things very readily, you know, onto our pets, onto Tamagotchi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Remember those things we used to have. But 
This question of why do we feel like this is something we need in our world, in our lives, I think really does need to be interrogated because just as much as we don't know what it would take to build a machine that has experience, we also don't know what it wouldn't take. And we might do it by accident, and we might not know if we've done it. And if, if this happens, it would be an ethical catastrophe because as soon as something can have experience, we have an ethical obligation to it to minimize its potential suffering. And if we don't even know the criteria by which to establish whether that's even a possibility, we're in really, really deep waters. So just building something because it sounds cool and you've seen it in science fiction and you want to be at the cutting edge of this pivotal moment in, in human history is a really, really terrible idea. So I, I think that you know, these, these goals of building actually conscious AI are, are just wrong. We should not be trying to do that. But having said that, there's a sense in which the two things are not maybe completely separate, consciousness and intelligence. Because the kinds of things, back to where we started the discussion, I think the kinds of things that a lot of current AI is not very good at seem to be the kinds of things that we are good at and that we associate with consciousness. It's like We're very good at generalizing to new situations. We're very good at reflecting on our own decisions. Um, uh, metacognition, these kinds of things, we know what, what we think about. We're very good at integrating large amounts of information very quickly. And these are the sorts of things that, that experiments in neuroscience psychology have shown are closely associated with human consciousness. So I think there's a case for building machines that have some of the functions that we associate with consciousness, but that's very different from the goal of trying to build a machine that feels, which I think is a really bad idea. But I, but I think, just, just pushing back a little there, I think there's a risk of saying computers can't do X, Y, and Z, because next year they'll be able to do X, maybe, and maybe the year after it's Y, and I think there's a risk that humans become the piece that's left over that machines haven't yet done, and the reality of AI as it exists today is actually completely the reverse. I think you commented earlier that there's a complementarity between what machines do and what, um, uh, and, and what the human brain does, and you know, coming back to your original question about Hollywood movies, there's a reason that Hollywood movies depict killer robots, because they've got to keep it entertained for two hours, right? And if you take, I mean, I'll just give you an example of AI in practice. We, we've developed a system called Inner Eye, which is actually deployed at uh, Adderbrook's Hospital in Cambridge. We developed in, in partnership with their, with their clinicians. Um, and it, uh, it's used to do radiation therapy planning. So if somebody has a, a solid tumour and, uh, and they need radiation therapy, uh, you need to know very precisely where the tumour is in three dimensions in order to treat it with radiation. And the way that's done uh, conventionally in most places now is the, you have a 3D body scan and the radiation oncologist goes through this layer by layer and marks the boundary of the, uh, the, boundary of the tumour. Um, it can take 20 minutes for a simple case, it can take several hours if it's metastasized and there are multiple tumours. Um, so what Inner Eye does is it, it does that automatically and presents a, a proposal for this three-dimensional segmentation, we call it, to the radiation oncologist, who then can go through and check and make any corrections and alterations. So the radiation oncologist is still doing this, this segmentation, but instead of taking several hours, they can just take a couple of minutes to check a proposal. And most of the time, they're not making many changes. 